We want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south. We bring you the latest teaching in the Torah. Today we'll be in Moses' Word of God in Exodus 8. 8 meaning a new beginning. And the Lord is the Lord God Almighty Elohim is going to test and destroy the first, uh, the first gods of, um, of Egypt. And we'll explain what each and every one of them. And remember again that the Lord is, uh, is coming against Pharaoh. He will consider himself the God of Egypt. The Egyptians worship many gods and there were actually 10 gods that were targeted. And we're going to talk about three, the frog, the lice, and the flies today as God of the universe, Elohim, the creator of all things, is going to show that his glory reigns over all these false gods. No matter what the sorcery can whip up, God is the creator of all things. And before we get any deeper into our study in the Torah of Exodus 8, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, we invite the Holy Spirit in. To be our teacher, let's get into God's Word and the Torah, Exodus. Moses coming up against the hardened heart of Pharaoh so that God can let his people go. His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they'll have the land of milk and honey forever. And we will see that God is, uh, says what he means and means what he says, literally. And the Lord, Jehovah, spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Jehovah, let my people go that they may serve me. He's given them a warning as God is giving man warning today. Man who's chasing other gods, worshiping anything other than the one God to his son Jesus Christ. He's warning, let my people go. Know who I am. I want to have a relationship with you. Let me show you these false gods that people talk about. And I will show that I am the creator of all things. As he did with Elijah when he rained down fire against the Baal gods and the Asterisk gods. And he showed that there is one true God who sits in the heaven. Even when Baal was supposed to be the god of fire, God used the fire to destroy the, the, the myth of the Baal god. And God will do it again with these three gods that the Egyptians are worshiping. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, uh, let them go, behold, I will smite you all your territory with frogs. So frogs, interesting, you know, the Nile, as we said before, the attack, the first one was the attack on the God of the Nile. They worshiped the God of the Nile. The Nile was their lifeblood. So you would have seen frogs around the Nile as you see frogs around any type of water. However, this is no frog and the, this is not any, uh, just a little bit of frogs. And there's a reason behind it, this goddess of the frogs. And we'll explain that when we get there. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house into your bedroom, on your bed, into your houses of the servants and your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come on you and your people and all your servants. So the frogs are going to absolutely take over the place. It'll be an, a, a, a plague, literally, of frogs. It'll be in your houses. They're not going to just be at the river anymore. Why did God choose frogs? Because God in each one of these tests is taking out one of their false gods, showing them that he is the God of the universe. And uh, we'll tell you about some near-death experiences, too. That are not, it's, they're not from the Bible, but uh, some people who have gone to seeing Sheol and had afterlife experiences. And I'll explain what, they, what they, they witnessed. And it ties right into these demonic frogs. And it also ties into the demonic of what we see in the book of Revelation with the shiny teeth of, of the locusts. But they're not locusts, they're demons. And the women's with long hair, they're gross, frog-like creatures. And that's what's been repeated over and over again by people who have gone to hell. And the Lord has brought them back as a warning. The frog was considered a thanopony, a, a triple god in the, de in the days of, of the Egyptians. It was the goddess of Hecht, H-A-E-Q-T the wife of the creator of the universe. And she was the goddess of birth, is what the Egyptians believed. And she was always shown in her, in her symbols of her to have, uh, to have a head of a frog and frogs all over her body. So God is attacking this falseness that this is the, the wife of the, of the creator of the universe and the creator of birth. And we're going to see again the birth coming from dust with Adam is going to be a symbol of lice. And that's another symbol of another false god that we're going to see later on. But the frog was a god that they worshipped, this goddess, who's considered the god of the creator of the universe. 
and we're going to see that he's take, taking on the God of the universe, their God of the universe, the God of the earth, and the God of their water, showing that there's only one God, and he is a God of all these things. These are false gods. Go back to the book, uh, back to the Old Testament. All these false gods, they're no longer here. They come and they go, as the old movie in baseball says. They come and they go, Hobbes. They come and they go. And the gods continue to come and go, and Satan just takes another god, sticks in another name, and starts in another worship. And, it, it play, and he hits replay over and over and again. Just change the name, but the cycle still continues to go. There is one god. He is a god, Elohim, in three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from the beginning of time. We see that in the book of the, in the Torah. And when God, meaning Elohim, created man in his image, meaning the God of three. That's what Elohim means in Hebrew. It means three. And we see it in the Gospel of John. Yes, the Gospel, which is a holy book in Islam. And it says that the Word was in the beginning. The Word was before the world started. The Word was with God. That means the Word was next to God. And the Word was God. So the Word was next to God. The Word was God. And the Gospel of John tells us that the Word became flesh. God came, became flesh through his son, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. And we're going to show that this uh, coming against the frog. As we said before, there's, um, there's been several near-death experiences where people have gone to hell. A couple of the people that went to hell uh, were going to go to hell, and God gave them a wake-up call and a second chance because of intercessor prayer of their mothers literally praying for these people to come back. Uh, one was a shark attack in, uh, off the coast of Australia. You can Google it. And uh, there's another that was a, a Christian that went to hell, not because of what he did, but to, to, to show the people a warning to come back. And uh, three or four of these stories have all said gross like demonic like frogs, exactly what it's talking about here in Exodus, meaning demonic frogs, and also what is described by John in the book of Revelation. Uh, they're not human, they're demons. They're demons, and this is Satan's way of prepping and faking and using sorcery. That's why the Lord tells us to stay away from witchcraft, stay away from sorcery, and the only truth is through the living word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, so the frogs have taken over, so we know why God is using the frogs, because they believe that this is goddess of giving birth to everything. So these giving birth to all these frogs. And he's going to show that he who gives us birth can also take, or gives us life can take away life, is what he's going to do with the frogs. Watch. Verse 4, And the frogs shall come unto you and your people and your servants. 5, Then the Jehovah spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the stream, over the water, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause the frogs to come up over the land of Egypt. So the power of Almighty God. Remember, the power is not in the rod. The power is in the Most High God. We don't worship the rod. We worship the God of the Creator. It was the power of the rod. Even though the rod was put in the Ark of the Covenant and budded, the power is in the Word of God. What gave the Ark of the Covenant and will always give the Ark of the Covenant the power is not the rod in the Ten Commandments. It is what the Ten Commandments are, is the living Word of God. That's where the power comes. Jesus Christ, He is the living Word. God, through Elohim and the Son, Jesus Christ, is what gives the ark the power. It gives the rod the power. It gives the authority. We worship the Creator, not the things. And that's what we see in uh, Hezekiah, where we'll see later on where, the, where the, the nation of Israel sins against the Lord, and the Lord sends them serpents. And Moses does a peculiar thing and follows directions from the Lord, and he puts up a bronze pole. We really don't understand it until it's told to us in the, in the New Testament. The bronze pole, bronze is a, is, is a fire judgment. And the pole represented the cross of Christ to take away the serpent, that the serpent would be crushed by the seed of the, the woman in Genesis 3.15. Those who looked at the pole, the bronze pole, were saved because of faith. And that will also be through the pole, the cross, that Jesus Christ would come in, foreshadowing by Moses in the, in the wilderness. And that pole... We see in Hezekiah, in the time of Hezekiah, they kept it in the temple and they were worshiping the pole and not the God, the creator. And so Hezekiah had to destroy the pole because they were worshiping the pole. We worship the creator, not any idol, no graven images. The Lord is very particular about what we worship. We don't worship angels. We don't worship saints. We worship God in the form of Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's it. Praise his name. And Aaron stretched it out over the land. And the, mag the magicians, which were from the demonic, they can do these type of things too, but not to the degree that God can. 
And they did their enchantments and brought up frogs from the land of Egypt, trying to go tit for tat. But God's tit for tat is nowhere near what Satan, uh, Satan can nowhere come near to God's tit for tat because God is the creator of all things. And remember, Satan is demonic. Satan is a great deceiver, but he's still a created being. And he knows where his home is. And that's why we know the word of God, because we know where Satan's going. All we have to do is finish the race. The Lord has already gotten victory on Calvary. We're, lead, we're reading this to encourage us. As Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, Exodus 8 to Revelation 8, on all in between, to Genesis 8, to Genesis 1, to Revelation 22, is God breathed. It means breathe in the lifeblood, the living love and the living word of the Lord is God breathed for our edification and our doctrine. He wants us to know the truth. He wants us to eat the living word. He wants us to have the, 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 liver, the, the river of flowing water, the eternal water that only Christ can give us. We read this to build us up for this journey. But if we have a Christ in our heart and our soul and our mind and we're working for the Lord, we know how it wins. We've already gained victory. Victory came on the cross in the name of our beloved Jesus Christ. Praise his name. Then, Ver then Pharaoh called Mo Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the, uh, Jehovah and may him take away the frogs from, from my people. He's saying, uh, enough. Okay, my, my, my sorcerers are pretty good at what they do, but obviously you've got something going on that is beating this uh, a queen, the wife of uh, the creator of the universe, who has the, all these frogs on her, so she may not be the strongest god. So again, Pharaoh's building himself up that all these gods are starting to fall. Nine gods fall before it gets to the one god who he thinks he is, Pharaoh himself, thinking, well, I'll rest on me. And that's what Satan's trying to do in the world today called universalism. You can be your own god. You can have positive thoughts and channel spirits from all over the place and be like God. That's not what the scripture says. Whereas we're to do the opposite. We're to humble ourselves and seek the face of the Lord with all our heart, our soul, and our mind and give it to Him. All glory goes to Him. It's a way of humility and it's a way of love, not a pride. Pride is what threw all these gods into, into uh, creation through Satan. Satan is prepping up every single one of these false gods with his lies and his deceptions. But as we look through history, ask ourselves this very important question. Where are these gods from the Old Testament today? Where is Dagon? Where is Heek? Where is Ashtoreth? Where is, where is Baal? They're gone. And a new god pops up. And a new god pops up every, every so four, five hundred, six hundred years. A new god comes up with the same characteristics as these old false gods. There's only been one god from the creation of time, and that god is Elohim, the god in three. And every single page of the Old Testament screams, of the love he has for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. And Moses said to Pharaoh, accept the honor of saying, when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So I'll intercede through, for you from the most high God. Because Pharaoh said, hey, hey, my comfort level's gone. You know, I can't even do a banquet. I can't even drink wine. I can't even lay down in my bed. There's disgusting frogs everywhere, and I'm sick of this frog. I am the God. So get him out of here. He's schizophrenic. And he said tomorrow, and he said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there's no one like the Jehovah our Elohim. He says, I'm putting you on notice from the Most High God. Moses is a faithful servant. He's doing exactly what the Lord asked him to do, going up against the superpower of the world that time, who he thinks has 10 gods going against his one God. And Moses is showing faith, the faith of the Most High, the Elohim of the universe. And he says, in your word, I'm holding you accountable, Pharaoh. God is holding you accountable. Elohim is holding you accountable. That no one like the Jehovah of our Elohim. That's a mighty thing to say. And the frogs shall depart from you and from your houses and from your servants, from your people. They shall remain in the river only. We'll back, go back to normal. But he's going to harden heart. He's going to say no. He's going to think about it. He's going to go back to his, his, his sorcerers and say, you know what, it's just a little bit better witchcraft than we have. We can, we can come up with another potion. We can come up with another seance. Let's, let's do it. Harden of heart. Deny, 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 deny. Fake, 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 fake. And the Lord is going to hold him in derision. As he said to David in Psalm 2, I will hold them in derision, those who will come against my anointed. So Jehovah did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered together in heaps, and the land stank. 
So it was stinking, you know, the smell of dead animals. Can you imagine just thousands and thousands and thousands of frogs who they literally worshipped the, 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 the frog god of this, this goddess who walked around with a frog on her head and a frog on her, on her body representing uh, the, the, the wife of the creator of the universe and the creator of life itself. And the creator of the universe and creator of life itself is the most high God, Elohim, when he breathed in to Adam. And we're going to see from dust he did. And that's going to be the second symbol of lice. And that was a God that they lived for too, the God of the earth that created this, created all things in the Egyptian eyes. And God, the one God, Elohim, is going to take that on as well. And the Lord said to him, stretch out your rod and uh, all the land of Egypt. Um, uh, the, the land stink. Verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart. He says, whew, there's relief. Now I can go back. And that's kind of like us in our prayer life too. And when we're just kind of walking through life and not trusting in the Lord, we pray to the Lord when times are in trouble, when it's 911. That's the way I used to be until God got, got my attention and, and humbled me and stopped me from being a goat running into the wall all the time and being the harden of my heart. We, we pray when we're in trouble. And once we get out of that trouble, we go back, to the, go, go back to our old ways. Whether we're just barely saved and going to heaven or not saved at all, then we're just using God for a particular purpose in our life, but not giving our all, our heart, our soul, and our mind to him. And that's what Pharaoh is doing. He's not, he's not worshiping the true God, but he saw the relief. He's like, ooh, crisis is over. So I'm not going to fulfill my word. I'll go back on my word. Well, he went on a word to the Jehovah of the Elohim, he went to the God of the universe. And when you give your word to the God of the universe, God expects you to do that. Elohim. That's what it says in scripture. Jesus tells us, well, your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't say any type of covenant to the Lord. There's nothing you can say to impress the Lord and say, Lord, if you do this, I'll do that. No, because he's going to hold you accountable to that. And nothing you can do in the flesh is going to, is going to appease him. He's not going to surprise him. He's not going to glorify him. He doesn't want sacrifices. He doesn't want circumcision. He doesn't want work. He doesn't want your false incense. He wants your obedience. He wants you to love him with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. He wants you to trust him. And he wants you just to follow with him hand in hand and be obedient to him and trust him in all things. That's the true sign of love. That's what our God, Elohim, is looking for through his son, Jesus Christ. So the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land. Here in the Hebrew again, the dust, because they believed this lice God was representing the dust, the creator, their false God of creating the, the, the earth. And lice came on all the different animals all over the, the Egyptians and all on humans. So they believed that the dust came from, the lice came from the dust. So that's why God is using this lice. Uh, stretch out your rod and your iron, or your, your dust on the land so that it may become lice for all, all the land of Egypt. So they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck down the dust again of the earth and became, because they had an earth god and a god of water and a god of creation and a god of the earth, and became lice of man and beast because of the lice being on all things. They believed that he was the god of the earth through lice. That was his symbol. And all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the, mag the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So they couldn't even replicate this because there's only one creator of the universe. And God said, he spoke it into being in Genesis. So there was lice on man and beast. Lice was also the target of the, the, the um, entire, uh, was held holy by the Egyptians. They worship multi-gods and worship gods, the earth god. And lice or, uh, represented the organized, organization of the dust of the earth. And that's why the plague of the one god, Elohim, came against the God they believe of creation, the God of the waters, and here, the God of the earth, which the lice would have come out of the dust. And that's, so, that's why God used lice in this particular occasion. So the, magi the magicians could not do it. Verse 19, then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of Elohim. So even the enchanting demonic people are saying, whoa, this is of Elohim. This is not of, this is the one God. This God's better than the, the, four, the three gods so far and the fourth God that's coming. You better stand back and take, take aim because here is truly the God. 
He is showing himself, and they're saying, hey, I, can't, I can't replicate this. This is truly God of the universe. It's kind of when the demons came, when Jesus came up in, in the, mount, uh, the area of what we call the Golan Heights today. And he says, Son of God, Son of God, it's not our time yet. Why have you come? The demons know what time of their demise is coming. And they knew who he was. They knew he was the Son of God. He knew he, knew he was the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of the Most High God. So the demons know who the true God is, the one God, the creator, because Satan knows, because Satan was created by him. And he has been destroyed by Jesus Christ on Calvary. Praise his name. So uh, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of Elohim. He used the word Elohim. Heart grew hard and did not heed them, just as Jehovah had said. His heart is hard again. You got a hard at heart. You just, you kind of scratch your head and say, you know, this is the third God. He's gonna, you're going to see the fourth God be attacked and destroyed here. There's, your magicians are now saying, dude, man, look, wake up. I mean, we're supposed to be your advisors. We're supposed to be your spiritual leaders. This is Elohim. This is the God. This is the one God of the universe. You better take an eye. And we see this in Revelation, how hard people's heart can be. We see this in the, in, the, in, the, in the tribulation when the kings of the east come in and the Antichrist goes against God, goes against Jesus Christ. How hard and how wicked do you have to be when you realize in your heart that this is the God of the universe and this is the Messiah and you still want to destroy him like Nimrod did in the Torah and the book of Genesis? He knew who God was and he built the Tower of Babel to destroy God. He wanted to replace God with pride. And that's what Satan has done all through the times. From Nimrod to the coming Antichrist, Satan is trying to be like the Most High God and use a man to destroy and be like God. That's why it's called the Antichrist, or in the Greek, Antichristo, meaning pseudo-Christ, meaning like Christ, but demonic, coming in as the light, but he is of the darkness. And that's why we need to know the Scripture so that we're not fooled. That's why God wants us to be in his word, to know who his son is so that we can have eternal life so that we're not fooled by Satan's false characteristics and his false uh, sorcery. The Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and uh, stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then say to him, thus says Jehovah, let my people go that they may serve me. He's giving him a warning again, three warnings, and it's like baseball, three strikes and you're out. And he's not getting it. It's hard and hard. And again, we see this in the end of, even in the millennial reign in Revelation, we see the Christ comes in and fulfills the Davidic covenant, and we reign with him, the saints, for a thousand years. But there's earth dwellers that survive the, the tribulation, and they reproduce. They have sin nature in them because they don't have glorified bodies yet. But there's limited sin on the earth. They haven't been had the temptations of life like we have because Satan is locked in Sheol. He's in the pit. But Satan is let loose at the end of the season, it says, at the end of the thousand-year reign, and he will fool the many. They will be reigning and living with the Most High, King of kings and Lord of hosts through a millennial reign, and they get fooled by Satan again. And God says, no, that's it. It's over. It's done. Evil is done with once and for all. Open up the books. You've made your choice. You removed your own name from the Ram's Book of Life. And I now usher in the tabernacle with my people, called by my name with their heart for eternity. And there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. And we are in his glory forever. Praise his name. There's hope and our king is coming soon. Stand. His redemption is nigh. Or else if you, my people, uh, don't let my people go, behold, I will so send a swarm of flies. Now we're coming with flies. We'll explain this. There was actually a movie done on this too, uh, based off a book. And uh, the swarm of flies on you and your servants and your people and to your houses. The houses of Egypt shall be full of swarm of flies and also the ground which there stand. Flies get into the animals. Flies are disgusting. Fly, flies literally bring bacteria. They'll get into food. Uh, feces they'll get in they're just they're just absolutely disgusting and that day i'll set apart the, uh on your people into your house the house of egyptians shall be full of flies and that day i'll set apart the land of goshen in which my people dwell with no swarm of flies shall be there in order that you may know that i am the i am that i am the jehovah in the midst of the land so remember the area of goshen this is where the land joseph brought his people down and established the, the nation of israel and the nation of Israel was staying in Goshen. And that, so his people were protected from these flies where the rest of Egypt were infected with these flies. 
Verse 23, I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow the sign shall be. There's a difference. There's a covenant. Those who call upon my name with their heart, their soul, and their mind, I will protect. And we'll see later that he'll put the, the hyssop of blood on the doorpost to pass over the sin. And that's a foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood redemption of the cross. It took redemption for sin, and it took the sign of the cross on the doorpost, showing that the Messiah, the Lamb of God, would literally fulfill that at a later date on Passover, exactly the way it happened. Praise the name of the Most High. So I will make a difference. Tomorrow the sign shall be. There's a sign coming. Verse 24, And Jehovah did so. Thick swarm of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into a servant's house, into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarm of flies. Then Mer Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your Elohim in, your, in, in that land. He says, I've had enough. He has a moment of saying, okay, go ahead, I, I, enough, these flies, this is it, this is it. I, I can't take it. My, my, my sorcerers are telling me that you, you got something up your sleeve that's more than my gods. And uh, the flies were uh, uh, targets of the Egyptians' mythological god, meaning the lord of the flies. And his, the name in the Hebrew was Biel Zavuv, Z B Biel Zavuv. And that is meaning the Lord of the flies, that the Egyptians worship the fly, the Lord who contr controlled these flies. And Moses did, it's not right to do so, and uh, not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to Jehovah, our Elohim. So he's saying, no, we're not going to sacrifice in your corrupt land. We will go where the Lord tells us to go to put up an altar to sacrifice. Everything God does is measured to the dotting of the I and crossing the T, or in the Hebrew we'd say, um, to the Alf and the Tav, or to the Yacht and the Tittle, as Jesus said, the smallest blemish on the paper. That means God is very specific on his perfect time frame. So Egyptians to the Jehovah uh, Elohim, if we sacrifice the abomination to the Egyptians before the eyes, they will, not, they, they will stone us. Um, so we're not going to do it in front of your heathens. We're going to go where the Lord tells us. It's a three-day journey. No coincidence, again, about three days. Everything the Lord points to three is the Trinity. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit also represents that Jesus died uh, according to the scriptures, was put into uh, Sheol according to the scriptures and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures to be our first fruit as Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God as our high priest in the order of Melchizedek who will come back and become Lord of hosts. Uh, and three is in Judaism, the completion of Elohim's spirit, the completion of Yahweh, the unpronounceable name of the God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Jehovah our Elohim as he commanded us. Remember he told Abraham, three day journey. And where did he go to Mount Moriah? Everything a three day journey and Abraham going three days to Mount Moriah, the same area that Jesus would take take, take to, to Calvary, where God will sacrifice his only begotten son in the same place. It was foreshadowing what God of the universe was going to do with his only begotten son to test Abraham. Will you go three days and will you go up to Mount Moriah to, 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 to uh, sacrifice your son? Do you love your son more than you love the most high God? Abraham trusted in God. He didn't know what God was going to do. We don't know what he knew what God was going to do, but we know one thing by faith. He knew he had a covenant with, with Isaac. One way or another, God, God's word was on the line and I, Abraham was coming down with that boy. Whether he was resurrected, whatever the reason, Abraham had faith that that boy was coming back because God gave an everlasting covenant through the seed of Isaac and through the seed of Jacob. That's faith. That's why it was a credit to Abraham as righteous. So Pharaoh, I will let you go. Then you may sacrifice to the Jehovah, your Elohim, in the wilderness. He says, okay, okay, I relent. You can go your three days. You can go out and sacrifice to your God where you want to go. Only you shall not go very far, uh, intercede for me. Then Moses said, Indeed, I'm going out from you, and I will entreat the Jehovah. The swarms of the flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people, but let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore, not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Jehovah. You notice all these gods, and all the gods of the old, of the old, and some of the gods that we see today that are not the true God, Elohim of different religions, world religions, were in their holy books. They can say that their God can lie to further the religion. 
Well, the God of the universe, the true God, Elohim, he can't lie. He can never lie. We see Pharaoh thinks he's a God and he lies. We see the God of Baal lies. God, after, false God after false God lies, lies, lies. Why? Because he is the Wizard of Oz. Satan is the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain pulling these fake strings and these fake gods up as none other than the serpent, the Satan. And he is the father of lies. He's the father of deception. He's full of pride, full of hate, full of destruction, and full of lies. We don't trust anything other than the living word of God, which is truth, the only truth in this world of fake, 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 and lie, lie, lie. So Moses went out to Pharaoh and entreated the Jehovah. And Jehovah did according to the word of Moses. Moses was faithful. God is faithful. And he removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. No one remained. God did what he said he's going to do. But he knew what Pharaoh was going to do because God is the God of the elf, the top. He is the beginning and the end. He can see tomorrow. He knows exactly what decisions everyone will ever make. He knew us before our mother's womb. He knew us before the beginning of time. And he knows. And all he wants is a love relationship with us. And we close out in verse 32. But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time, hardened his heart for the fourth time, and neither would he let his people go. And the number four is the, is the number of the world. Pharaoh is living for the world because the first three gods that he had were the gods of the world, the false gods of the world. And he thinks he's the god of the world. But there is one that's higher. His name is the great I am that I am, the Elohim through his son Jesus Christ who gives us redemption. And if we trust in him and be obedient to him, he gives us everlasting life and a peace, joy, hope that the world can never give us. Seek his face while you can. And this is the end of Exodus 8. We pray that this has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Aaron bless you today and always. God bless you.